So, as you may already know, a few weeks ago there was something of a Twitter-based minor diplomatic incident between my country's government and the government of the so-called People's Republic of China. This is all, of course, regarding recently exposed Australian war crimes and a certain Chinese politician's response to said war crimes on Twitter. If you're not up to speed on the latest horrific atrocities carried out in Australia's name, allow me to give you the rundown. Our fine Aussie troops in the Special Air Services Regiment, or SAS, have been up to a bit of mischief. And by mischief, I do of course mean horrific war crimes. The Breton Report, which details the crimes in question, was finally released to the public, albeit in heavily redacted form, in late November this year. According to the report, 39 homicides have been confirmed in 23 incidents. 25 Australian soldiers have been implicated in these murders, following the testimonies of 350 witnesses. Many of the grisly details have been censored for national security reasons, but the Breton Report also contains references to the two reports made by military sociologist Dr. Samantha Krompvertz, wherein she documented allegations from soldiers that she'd interviewed. The soldiers described incidents where entire villages would be cordoned off before men and boys were dragged to buildings where they'd be tied up, blindfolded, and tortured for days at a time, before being shot in the back of the head or having their throats slit. On one occasion, two 14-year-old boys were stopped and searched before having their throats slit, their bodies bagged, and thrown into a river. The soldiers she spoke to repeatedly emphasised that these were not isolated incidents, but part of a wider culture of bloodlust and brutality, and systematic intimidation and covering up in order to make sure these killings could continue freely. Now, we as a country, as Australians, would have been all too happy to just forget any of this ever happened and move on with our lives. After all, we are disbanding the second squadron of the SAS, right? We've said how very sorry we are for what those few bad apples did and we're moving on. No need for any more discussion. But no. Some people apparently decided that we should be held a little more accountable for doing the unfathomably horrible things that we did. One of those people was Chinese CGI artist Wu He Chilin, sorry for pronunciation, who put together this now infamous dramatised image depicting a gleeful Australian troop preparing to slit the throat of a small child. Another was Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Li Jian Zhao, again apologies for pronunciation, who shared the image on Twitter along with a message condemning war crimes carried out by Australian soldiers. This, of course, was met with immediate outrage by the Australian political establishment, from the ruling Liberal Party, to the Labour Party in opposition, and even the comparatively progressive Greens Party. The most notable voice in this cacophony of righteous outrage was, of course, none other than Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who in a public statement said, The repugnant post made today of an image, a falsified image, of an Australian soldier threatening a young child with a knife, a post made on an official Chinese government Twitter account, posted by the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Li Jian Zhao, is truly repugnant. It is deeply offensive. The Chinese government should be totally ashamed of this post. It, dis it diminishes them in the world's eyes. Yeah, it's a good thing we haven't done any shameful things that would diminish our country in the world's eyes, hey? Another funny thing about all this, you'll be hard pressed to find a mention of this image by Australian politicians or media that doesn't go out of its way to describe it as fake, or doctored, or falsified as old ScoMo puts it. As if the artist was trying to convince people that Aussie troops carry around giant flags to cover bodies with, or that the war crimes took place on top of a giant jigsaw puzzle in the image of the Afghanistan flag suspended over a black void. But wait, it gets better. I want to make a couple of points about this. Australia 
is seeking an apology from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from the Chinese government for this outrageous post. We are also seeking its removal immediately and have also contacted Twitter to take it down immediately. It is a false image and a, a terrible slur on our great defence forces and the men and women who've served in that uniform for over 100 years. Apologise, he says. We're in a context where Australian troops operating on foreign soil have just been found responsible for heinous crimes against humanity, including, yes, literally slitting the throats of defenceless children, and already the Australian government thinks it has the right to ask anyone else for an apology. In response to Scott Morrison's demands for such an apology, Wu Hechilin announced his intention to produce another piece, this time to attack the Prime Minister directly. And so he did, producing this rather excellent image which I found so fantastic, I decided to share it on my Twitter, along with a few words of commentary of my own. I wasn't really expecting much to come of it, mostly because I only have about 240 Twitter followers, but apparently there's a certain type of individual with a very keen sense of smell for tweets like this. And, sure enough, the doggies came out to play. Take your pasty white ass and get out of my country then. Perhaps China would be better suited to your human rights beliefs. China, the world's voice of reason? You'd better recall the millions who starved to death because of Mao. The millions dying now because of the CCP virus. The tens of thousands of murdered Falun Gong supporters. And tens of thousands of murdered, imprisoned and working in slave labour in Xinjiang. And stand for numerous of Chinese college students who were butchered by the Chinese communists. Uyghurs need an apology. Fear not, my sensitive little socialist. The capitalist militaries are leaving now, and the Taliban are back in control. I'm sure your solidarity will give them comfort in the years ahead. Good luck with your video career. Don't fret, there's always Job Seeker. Communism is cancer. This guy seemingly deleted his Twitter account after I responded to him, which just goes to show never to underestimate the power of a snappy comeback. Another fellow tagged me into a tweet thread about Xinjiang detention camps two days later, seemingly to call out my supposed hypocritical adoration for the CCP. I responded with a condemnation of the Chinese government to try and clear the air, and asked him if he'd be willing to offer an equivalent condemnation of the Australian government for its crimes against humanity. He agreed to do so provided I could give examples, which I did including its massacres of indigenous peoples, its ethnic cleansing of the stolen generations, its enthusiastic support for brutal foreign dictatorships, and its ongoing systematic detainment and torture of asylum seekers. Clearly all of this was not quite enough for old Brian, as he neglected to respond any further. You might have noticed a bit of a theme with these tweets. Even though they're clearly very angry with me and my condemnation of Australian war crimes, for the most part, that's not what they're attacking. They're just talking about the nasty things China's done, or how bad the Taliban is. Obviously, these folks aren't quite cooked enough to log on to Twitter and go off about how slitting teenagers' throats and murdering civilians in cold blood is based AF, so all they've got in their arsenal when it comes to justifying their continued support of Australian imperialism is to remind us that other countries' governments also do bad things. Although I have to give an honourable mention to Eleanor here for skipping the China bashing and actually being cooked enough to have a go at justifying the war crimes directly. Well done Eleanor, you've done your nation proud. Now the fact is, in spite of what most of these people have to tell themselves to justify their anger at me, I am not in fact a particularly big fan of the Chinese government, as I repeatedly made clear in my replies and was, of course, repeatedly conveniently ignored on. Which is why I was more than a tad disturbed when I decided to do a bit more digging on our Chinese CGI artist friend Wu He Chilin here. In retrospect, I'd probably retract my statement in my tweet that I'd like to shake his hand, given my somewhat unsurprising discovery that he happens to be a hardcore Chinese nationalist. 
and just as fanatically supportive of his cruel and oppressive government as the Aussie patriots in my replies are of theirs. Here's his self-described favourite piece, Cannon Fodder, which portrays the ongoing mass protests in Hong Kong, depicting a series of sinister masked figures who are implied to be the puppet masters behind the protests. These include Donald Trump, Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen, and perhaps most prominently due to his fully exposed face, none other than one Mr. George Soros. Got his finger in a lot of pies, old Georgie, doesn't he? I guess when he's not hard at work trying to destroy America, he's busy trying to destroy China as well. Bloody fence sitter, isn't he? Pick a fucking side, man. Jesus. And right there in the center, we have a young protester with a slingshot aimed at an oncoming train as he stands in the middle of the tracks. I'm guessing the oncoming train is meant to represent the might of the Hong Kong Police Department? Not entirely sure that being depicted as a speeding train barreling towards a young child is really a good look for them, but hey, what would I know about political propaganda? The common factor between the hardcore Australia stands and the hardcore China stands having at it on Twitter is a particularly nasty disease of the mind commonly known as nationalism. Nationalism is a political fixation on the idea of the nation. The idea that my nation is really good, and I have an interest in upholding my nation against its enemies, which are really bad. The ruling class love a bit of nationalism, because citizens who are nationalistic are much more likely to support them when they do nasty things like beat up protesters, or start wars that kill millions of people so that they can make more money. To be honest, I find the whole framing of this issue around war crimes somewhat problematic. I think it can imply that war itself is acceptable as long as we do it in a certain way and refrain from certain particularly barbaric practices. Let's not beat around the bush here. War itself is the crime. The Brereton Report contains information on 39 people killed in this war. 39 may not seem like a big number as a number, but in terms of human life? One human life cut short is a heartbreaking tragedy, multiplied by 39, that is an unfathomable level of suffering brought into the world. War crimes aside, now let's look at the total number of casualties of the war, from its beginning in 2001 to the time of account conducted in the Brown University study Costs of War, published in 2018. Are you ready? 147,000. Nearly 40,000 of those being civilians. Why? What possible justification could there be for all this bloodshed? Well, if you want to believe the ruling classes of the countries responsible, the invasion of Afghanistan was a measured and justified response to 9-11, an action that would protect us from similar attacks in the future a war on terror. The Afghanistan war didn't face as much opposition as some other wars did, precisely because our governments were so effective in framing the invasion in this way. For the ruling class though, as much as they got up and pretended otherwise, to them the 9-11 attacks were not so much a tragedy as an opportunity. An opportunity to launch an invasion that could expand their imperial influence in the Middle East and open up access to new resources and new markets. This is the true nature of war under capitalism, which is why it's not enough to call for one fucking military unit to be held accountable. It's not enough to call for the Australian government to be held accountable. What we need to be demanding is an immediate end to the war in Afghanistan and the immediate removal of every last troop from Afghan soil. And next time our masters want us to go fight in a new war to expand their power and riches, we need to be ready to hit the streets in our millions to tell them to get fucked. Enough said.